Well, thank you for uh, making it tonight. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that has uh, really impacted the New York tech ecosystem over the last couple of years has been the rise of accelerators, and um, I thought it would be a very apropos uh, time to to get them together and hear a little bit about what what they each do and uh, help. Um, uh, bring some insight into the sector. And as, um, you know, very much these, these accelerators reflect the rise of, of New York as a, as a tech center. And uh, each of these people I've, I've known for quite some time and had a lot of respect for them. So I'm very pleased that they're able to make it tonight. Um, and in that vein, what uh, I'm going to ask them each to do is, is if, if you know about accelerators at all, at the end of each accelerator class of entrepreneurs uh, that they have, at the end of the, the, their three-month three, or three month cycle or the six-month cycle or whatever they have, uh, they, they have a demo day. And so they give each entrepreneur a chance in front of their investors to present for you know, five to seven minutes. And so I thought it would be good before we dove into the conversation to allow each, each of uh, the folks here tonight to, to give a little bit about what they do, and because they're each all actually very very different and not it's not monolithic at all, um, and I think you'll find it very interesting. So what we'll do is we'll start with uh, um, Brad Weinberg from uh, um, Blueprint Health and um, have him because he he actually has to leave a little early as well. So why don't we start with Brad and we'll work our way down uh, the rest of the panel. So thank you, Brad, Steve. Thanks. Um, so just as a show of hands real quick, how many people are entrepreneurs? Just so we can get an idea. Good. This is the audience that, that I love to talk to. I'm an entrepreneur myself. Um, have an MD, but just a name only. Um, I'm really at heart with you guys. And I think what you hear from uh, most of the accelerators started by people that have been in your shoes um, and have a real passion for helping out entrepreneurs. We're a healthcare-focused um, accelerator. We work very hands-on with entrepreneurs. I was just out at a hospital system doing a sales call with, with one of our entrepreneurs. So we get um, really in the weeds with, with our entrepreneurs, really helping them over a three-month period really figure out what their value proposition is for their customers and how they state that, how they state, then take that, that message and they turn that into a pitch where they can raise money with it and talk to investors about it, and then attract talent. And if you can attract customers and investors and talent, you, you probably have a company. Um, and so that's what we do. Our belief is if you get really smart people, you get them with the best network that really knows their industry, which in our case is very heavily focused on, on healthcare. We have the largest network of healthcare entrepreneurs, um, strategic, and, and, and folks who invest in the healthcare industry of any accelerator. Um, if you put really smart people, you give them really great resources and tools, and you teach them some of the mistakes that, that people made before them that they hopefully don't repeat, they have a lot better chance of success, and then you get out of their way and let them do what really good entrepreneurs do, which is build really good businesses. So in a short, that's what we do. We run two programs a year. We've invested in 30 companies so far, um, and uh, really love helping be kind of a shepherd for the healthcare IT um, entrepreneurship community in New York. Great. Thanks, Brad. Um, any questions for Brad? Okay. Yeah, so um, most of the programs have somewhat of a similar format. They provide a very small, small amount of capital. In our case, it's 20K. You'll see anywhere from 20 to 100K, um, all different forms and formats. Ours are very straight. Um, notes, their founder's equity, and very few conditions um, behind it. If you're looking at any of these programs, I encourage you to look at their, you know, ask them really for their terms and really get um, know what they are. Um, we provide that, we get, we and we provide them with three months of office space and really hands-on work with, with our community. And in return, um, companies give us a 6% equity stake in their business. It's all uh, founder common equity. Okay. Uh, the three-month period, is that a resource for a dedicated period, or do you find it? 
if I could make it six weeks, I would make it six weeks. Um, so kind of what I said before, our belief is that in many ways what we do is a distraction to a good entrepreneur. Um, but we hope it's a, an appropriate distraction. It's a distraction from the core thing they need to do, which is get customers. Like that's, that's the secret sauce of a business, get customers. So we're doing some things that hopefully, uh, that distract in some way, but prove to be very valuable over time. We give them tools and resources so they have a better message, so they get more customers more quickly. We put them in front of more customers so they get more customers more quickly. We help them get the capital so that they can actually support those customers and build their team. Um, so we, we believe that you find good entrepreneurs, you do it as quick as you can, you get them the tools, and then you support them through their life cycle. So what a company that has two employees needs is very different than what a company with 10 employees, 50 employees, 100 employees need. And they really join a family in that regards, and we're always there for them to come back and ask us, hey, I'm you know, thinking of hiring my first manager of a business unit. What do I, what do I look for? What do, how is that different than my first five employees? Yeah, so it's all healthcare IT, and it's, it's pretty broad in that space. The, the core thing that we look for our companies to articulate is who's a customer, do they have a pain point, why do they have a willingness to pay, and can you get to a, a business that has a half a million dollar revenue run rate? That's really what we're looking for with a strong team, a team that, has, that can execute, just get stuff done. There's people that we want to work for, with for three months in the same office. Um, and they range from procurement software for hospitals. Amazingly, procurement's the second biggest cost center for hospitals. It's a really sexy business if you get into it. Uh, to hand hygiene businesses, worker, workers' compensation, um, a, tri a, a online triage business that was just on CNBC yesterday. Um, all of our, our portfolio companies are on our website, and it, it spans a, a pretty wide breadth across hospital, um, across the healthcare industry. You'll see common customers, hospitals, insurance companies, pharmacies, medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies. We have on the 500K run rate. Um, We've been around for two, so to answer your first question, we've been around for two years. We've run, this is our, we're currently in our third program. Each program has about 10 companies in it. Um, we haven't had any exits yet, so the oldest companies out of our program are nine months old. So hopefully, hopefully within the next three, four years, <laughs> uh, we have some good exits, but we have some companies that are performing really well that have gotten investment from top chair VCs and, and really strong angels. So you, you oh, hold on a second. If you, if you could wait for the microphone, that'd be great. Hello? Okay. Are, you bef um, are you just after the friends and family round, typically, or before? Yeah. Uh, we're anywhere from two guys with a napkin and an idea to a million in revenue. Um, it's kind of been the latest stage company that we've gotten involved with so far. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. All these small companies probably can't afford high-priced lawyers or accounts. No. Most people can't. But uh, my question is, so if they have a legal issue in biotechnology or healthcare or an accounting issue, yep. do you try and provide them with common services? Yeah, and I, th I think you'll hear across all of us. So most of us have worked with service providers um, to, to provide um, I mean, in our case, on, on the legal side, we have kind of defined uh, fixed, like, people get the first $25,000 of legal, legal fees deferred so that they can, they can actually get, get um, legal services. Um, certain, they can get free services from a number of vendors that we have. Um, that stuff's kind of widely available through the entrepreneurship network. Some people, I mean, we're part of the Techstars, or the Global Accelerator Network that was started by Techstars, and they provide a lot of those uh, benefits as, as part of that program. I would say these days, um, you, can go to, you can go to most professional services firm, and if, 
um, especially on the on the on the law side. And if you're an attractive deal and you have the right relationships, you can you can create a deal that works for you. Um, and so the our belief is that these days it helps to have the right relationships that kind of greases the wheels around some of those operational issues. Um, but they're typically not the core issues that are getting in the way of a, of a good business um, doing what it needs to do. Definitely on the, and we're on the healthcare IT side. If you get into the biotech side, whole different issues. We, we don't do stuff with the FDA and, and things that, that need deep legal. Great. Thanks, Brad. Why don't, why don't we um, go on to John now from uh, ERA. And um, if, if after his uh, um, intro, if you have any questions specifically for what ERA does, that'd be great. And then we're going to have a general conversation. Where I love all the questions. This is awesome. So keep on asking the questions. But if you have anything specific for each one of these individually, that'd be great. So John, why don't you get into it? Gotcha. Well, I'll try not to be repetitive because some of what we do is going to sound similar. So what Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator does is, again, we're a, uh, you know early stage technology accelerator. In a lot of ways, we play in the world that they don't. Uh, basically, non-healthcare IT is what we focus on. And um, I'll explain what we do. And again, some of it will sound similar and some of it's a little different. Our focus as an accelerator is, we, we say, buy New York for New York. We focus on companies that we think belong in New York City and ought to be here. And actually, we believe more broadly for a lot of companies, this is the most exciting place to be, and I think these guys will probably agree with me, uh, anywhere right now in, in the country to, to do an early stage tech startup. And what does that mean for us? Well, there's a whole lot of industries that means things like media, publishing, advertising, fashion, finance, uh, entertainment, sports, commerce, creative services. It's, it's pretty wide. And um, it, that doesn't mean it's unfocused for us, but it means it's areas where we believe companies can succeed here. And so that's our, that's our, our broad thesis. Um, what we look for is, you know, number one, great teams. We look for great founders that we're really excited about you know, working with and, and backing. And number one, and number two, playing in interesting industries. And when I'm going in order, obviously, ideally, you find the perfect company that has everything. And I think these guys will probably agree as early as we go, you rarely find the perfect company. But uh, great teams and in interesting industries. And then third and final would be business model. And, and that basically reflects a belief that if you can take a great team in a big industry, they'll figure it out. And that's you know, broadly what, what I think a lot of accelerators are there to do. It's how to help companies move faster, succeed faster. And we'd like to think that we help do that. Uh, we have a four-month program now. And during that four months, uh, we focus on, we like to think of three things. First of all, product and, and helping the companies uh, either get a product out the door if they don't have one or improve a product if they do. Second, you know, marketing or you know, getting customers. We take both business to consumer and business to business companies focused. It's about half and half. So it means different things for different kind of companies. But basically, get the product into people's hands and does the dog eat the dog food. Um, we place a, a <coughs> higher premium than a lot of our West Coast counterparts on early revenue. And we like to encourage our customers very early to see, will someone pay for something? And that doesn't sound controversial, but believe it or not, in the world of early stage tech investing, it actually is. Um, third and finally, we you know, help our companies get funded. And you know, when I say that, it's how to tell a metric-driven story or an investor-friendly story that makes it easier for the companies to raise money. And, um, and that's the, the, the three points of the program. What actually happens during the program is, uh, well, first of all, we invest $40,000 into each company. And um, that's, you know, as I said, everyone invests something in, in, that, in that range. Uh, what we then do is we give them free, you know, free housing for the four months in our co-working space in, in times uh, Chelsea, we moved, sorry. Um, and also things like free legal from our legal sponsors, free accounting, free hosting in the cloud, free software. And all that stuff is designed to let them just focus on what they need to do, like get the product out, get their, get their company moving, and not get distracted by how do I pay, you know, how do, can I call a lawyer today or not to figure out so I don't do something in some agreement that's going to bankrupt my company in six months. It's obviously extreme, but how not to worry about that and get moving. So th that's what we give them. The, the crux of the program is we've got a group of about 250 mentors that provide hands-on help to the companies. And these mentors come from all walks of life. Some are experienced entrepreneurs. Some are industry experts, functional experts. Uh, some are, hopefully not too many, um, venture capitalists. Um, sorry if there are VCs here. Um, but, uh, and what, what they're, and obviously not all 250 work with every company, 
but the idea is these different companies have different challenges, whether it be around customer acquisition or database sharding or which is the right uh, kind of customer partnerships to make their company grow. And um, through those four months, it's a little like drinking out of a garden hose. We try to get them together with as many people as possible to you know, help their business, you know, get more business partnerships, improve their product, and help it succeed. Um, we do have, you know, the we have a featured speaker every week. If you want to get a little sense of what the life is like, uh, we've got functional workshops a couple days a week, and the rest of it is focused on individual one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, in addition to the mentors, each company has a lead mentor that works with them every week just to make sure they're staying on track. And there's three of us, uh, myself, who's I'm a serial entrepreneur, and my two partners, one's a career engineer and the third a venture capitalist. And our idea is by providing a different and a difference of opinion in terms of uh, perspective, it helps build stronger companies. Um, you know, that's the kind of quick version of what we do. We've been around for, uh, I guess, two years now. We've got 40 companies that we've invested in uh, across four classes. We run two classes a year, uh, winter and summer. Um, and you know, that's the, you know, that's, that's the real quick version of what we do. We're really excited about New York as a tech center. And um, I think the more institutions like you know, us and all these guys stable, I think the better for, for creating a, a great generation of New York tech companies. So. Great. Question in the back? Do you want to give him a mic? Uh, yeah, I'm actually just curious. Um, this is for either or both of the speakers that have gone so far. Um, to what extent it's the case that you, know, you get a group of a bunch of small sort of teams working together in a related field, and two of them realize, hey, actually, we're working on the same problem or something similar enough that we should just get together and like merge or something like that? Or do you also then, or do you try to prevent that and say, hey, actually, we've already got a team that's working on this kind of a problem. We don't want you in our accelerator right now. Like, wait till the next rotation or something like that. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, for us, within a cohort, so it certainly is a case that some early, com early stage companies do pivot. We don't encourage it, but I think everyone will find some companies do change their business model or occasionally their businesses during the course of four months. Um, in terms of them joining up, um, we would probably discourage it, and we haven't seen that. We try to avoid direct competitors within the cohort of 10 companies. That actually creates some conflict that we'd like to avoid. I and mean, within our whole portfolio, it's inevitable. But within those 10, we would probably avoid it. I don't know if that answers your question. But you guys, yeah. so. why don't we, um, since some of these questions are more general, why don't, why don't we go to the next presenter, um, <coughs> Mark? Great. Go ahead. Thanks. OK. Do you want me to? Uh, sure, go ahead. Slides? It'll make uh, things a little more livelier. OK, sure. I don't know how to get them. How do we get them? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't do. I guess there was some confusion about whether we were doing presentations okay. or not. And I guess. Okay. Hold on a second. We've got to bring in our. Uh, uh, there you go. Oh, there you go. What do you know? Look at that. You got a video? Funny. What's that? You got a video? No video. Does, does, isn't that like part of every demo day? Like every day, like a little dancing. Oh, look at this. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like demo day. Work. Video problems getting work. it started. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, you're a video. Oh, right. Okay. So, um, say the, well, okay. The fonts aren't exactly right here. Imagine as you're going through this presentation, all the text in a way cooler font than what you're seeing here. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, my name is Mark Walken. I'm the managing director for Dream It uh, New York. And again, there's going to be a lot of, I'll, I'll try not to be repetitive with, with this, the stuff that you've, you've heard, um, but you know, there are a lot of uh, very similar themes. So you can think of it as like when you, you, know, <laughs> you read a book and then you go see the movie, or you go see a movie and go see the book, and it reinforces each other. So hopefully it'll be helpful in that respect. But I think you'll find that a lot of the same, um, you know, a lot of the same themes um, that, that you just heard are in our program as well. Um, just quickly, a little, just a little bit about my background. Uh, also, uh, former entrepreneur, um, and probably future entrepreneur as well. Um, I've uh, been in the internet space really as long as probably you know anybody since since '94 here in New York. Um, helped start the, the new media area at Sony Music. Helped launch their original website. I'm probably older older than I look, <laughs> um, and uh, you know helped grow Sony's kind of new media area for um, for most of the '90s, and then in 2001 left there and started my own company called Optimost, which basically um, does testing and optimization of websites, an enterprise solution for testing copy, layout, offers, that kind of stuff, and grew that to about 85 employees, and then sold that, 
in um, in 2007, and and shortly thereafter, I uh, went to get really back into the startup world because that's where I think my real my real passion is. And now I kind of have two hats. I, I run the the Dreamit program, which you'll hear about in a second, and I also have my own fund called Upstage Ventures, where I do um, early stage investing um, as well, you know, angel type investing. Um, so Dreamit, um, basically, uh, you know, similar kinds of things. It's an accelerator program, three month program. And what we really try to do is, is let uh, help companies accomplish in, in three months what it might normally take them 12 or 18 months to do on their own by providing them just all the resources that really can just kind of expedite their growth. And I think you've heard a lot of these things before, um, but it's a combination of, of a lot of different things. It's capital. In our case, it's actually arranged typically in the 20 to $25,000 range. Um, really depends on the size of the team. Uh, but we provide them with capital and, and of course, um, access to a lot of future capital through the um, you know, large number of, of VCs and angels who come through our program, during the program, and through a, a large demo day, which is attended by you know, hundreds of investors at the end of the program. Um, we provide uh, you know, mentorship is obviously a key part of it, both from the, the partners like myself, but also um, a, a very long list of, of advisors um, who are you know, from all different parts of the kind of technology, entrepreneurial, and just general business community. Uh, the community piece of, the, of it is, is very important. These guys touched on it a little also. Um, the, just the idea of having, we have 15 companies in a class, and having 15 you know, groups of really, really smart people, really, really passionate and working really, really hard uh, is really a, a pretty uh, incredible environment. And, and uh, I think just that, that enthusiasm just feeds off each other and uh, motivates each other, and it's, it's, a, it's kind of, uh, I, I think when you ask companies who've been through the program at the end what was the most valuable part of it, they may come in thinking, you know, well, I could, you know, getting some capital is really a great thing, but when they come out, they almost universally will say the community piece um, was so important, both within the companies they met in the program, but also the, the pretty significant alumni base that we've now created, now that we've had about 95 companies through our program. And then the connections. The question was asked before about legal and accounting. So we do provide, um, we provide free legal and accounting services for the companies uh, through partners that we have, um, PR and, and other kinds of things like that. Uh, so so and also just other you know numerous other partnerships, whether it's web hosting or other types of things, just to uh, defray the costs um, for for them getting off the ground. And it's a three-month program, but but I think it's important to mention. I think these guys would say the same thing. It's 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 while for three months you know, we're, we're kind of living with them 24/7, pretty much, and it's full time. Um, it's not like we just kick them to the curb and say good luck. Um, we're still there to provide them advice and and help. Um, not necessarily real estate, um, although I guess some of these guys do at this point. But but um, but we do. We, we are certainly always there for them. In fact, today I've already I had two different meetings with companies who are in the middle of, of subsequent fundraising rounds, and you know, I was giving them advice on on the term sheets and the negotiations and that kind of stuff. So we're constantly there to help them. Um, again, it's not it's not every day, but um, you know, we're we're obviously have since we have an equity stake in our case, it's a six percent equity stake. We obviously have a an incentive to. Um, to see them be successful. Uh, so Dreamit's been around, we're, we're ancient, I guess, compared to uh, the, uh, those panels. We've been around since 2008. Uh, so we've been around for five years and you know, started out in 2008, uh, just a program in Philadelphia uh, with 10 companies. And now we run basically um, four, four, in four different cities, New York, Philadelphia, Austin, and Israel. <clears throat> and we've done seven, seven cycles um, since 2008. I said 95 companies have been through the program and you know, together have raised a pretty significant amount of, amount of capital um, you know, over the years. And um, it's probably hard to read this, so we're running, we're, I don't know what we're going to do with because we're gonna not going to have room for the logos. We're going to have to start <laughs> kicking some off the slide, I guess. But, um, but you know, a, lot of, a lot of companies from a lot of different industries, some of the more noteworthy ones you may have heard of is one called um, Scavenger. Also, which is kind of morphed into a company called Level Up, which is kind of a leading mobile payments solution that has done extremely well. Um, in New York here, there's a company called Adaptly, which is a social, um, kind of a social media advertising platform, which has done extremely well. Uh, SeatGeek in the, in the kind of secondary ticket market, and uh, MindSnacks, which is in the, in the education space, which just ra raised a big round from Sequoia out on the West Coast. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty diverse mix and you know, a lot of companies doing, doing you know, quite well. Um, 
been a, been a couple of exits. Uh, the biggest one being a company called Note Hall, which is in, also in the education space, which was acquired by Chegg um, a couple couple summers ago. Uh, and the companies are, are I, I mean, a, a lot of our focus is very much in the Northeast. I mean, the, the majority of our companies are in the New York and Philadelphia area, and obviously we're, we're very, um, very bullish on, on New York and, um, and, and just uh, the, you know, the Northeast more broadly, uh, although we do now have a program in Austin, and, and I've had a number of international companies as well. Um, you know, our partners, uh, similar to, to what you heard here, uh, you know, most of us are also um, uh, Former entrepreneurs, um, four of us have have you know, built companies and exited them, and you know, we bring a lot of I think expertise in a lot of different areas that I think is beneficial for the company. But obviously, to supplement what we do, uh, we do have a, a very extensive list. This is kind of a snapshot of it of, of advisors who who really run the gamut, uh, who can bring specific domain expertise to companies or uh, expertise in, in in fundraising or or whatever the case may be. And uh, I think that's basically it. Um, although I will add that we're right actually in the middle of an applic our application process for our next New York cycle. So for those who are entrepreneurs out there and are interested in this kind of thing, uh, I encourage you to apply the deadlines in about uh, in about a month. So that's that's basically it. Okay. Um, actually, um, so now I think we'll go to Maria, who's got a slightly different take on this uh, space. Thank you. So I didn't bring any slides, but whoever set the room up has provided me with a very nice visual that I can leave with you. So think of it as that's where you start your company, and when you're ready to leap over to get customers, that's when you come over to our programs. And we've actually taken a couple, at least one company from uh, Blueprint Health. Um, just two lines of background on uh, who I am in our fund, just because that provides some good context. So the fund I run is the Partnership for New York City Fund formerly known as, not Prince, but the New York City Investment Fund. And uh, we are a civic fund, nonprofit, but our money comes from the business community. And uh, we're part of a group called the Partnership for New York City, which is a... Um, <laughs> it's, it wasn't anything Good night. Said, I don't Membership, think. which is a, there you go. Thank you. Um, a little Super Bowl moment there. Again, uh, organization <laughs> of uh, is Beyonce coming? Uh, uh, organization of uh, uh, CEOs of big companies. So we are sort of of and from the big corporate world in New York. That's our constituency. That's where our money comes from. Um, and if we make any money and make returns on our investments, it just comes back to our fund to make other investments. So the investors really put the money up for the good of New York. So as we sort of looked at the landscape, um, it, uh, as those of you that are entrepreneurs know, it's gotten cheaper to start companies. You know, 10 years ago in New York, it was $5 million was a typical raise, and now you start with half a million dollars. But the cost to get your customers has not gone down. And you could even argue that it's gone up because you've got now more technology companies competing for the same set of customers. And what New York, one of New York's strengths and or assets that New York, that we have is we have big corporations that have big technology budgets. And two in particular are financial services, where the capital financial services, certainly in the US, if not the world, depending on how much you want to brag. Um, and we also have a lot of providers, hospitals, doctors, et cetera. So as we thought about how do we sort of play in the entrepreneurial world, leverage the strength of New York, leverage the strength that we have, it kept coming back to the big corporate. So the model that we've developed, and uh, we call one of them a lab, and we call one of them an accelerator, and I don't like either name, because it's really sort of doesn't give the right word. So if anybody has a good name, when I'm done describing what we do, I'm happy to talk to you. But what we do is really focus on helping early and growth stage customers. So we're later than a typical accelerator. Get access to your customers in a very sort of senior, expedited way. And we do it by, in effect, kind of managing that engagement over a defined period of time. Uh, so the, the two programs that we've put together, uh, similar model but slightly different flavors. Uh, the first one is the FinTech Innovation Lab, where the market that we've aggregated are the big financial services firms. So we have 14 of the big banks. We've just this year added an insurance company, as well as part of the 14. And then we run a, a, a different program called the Digital Health Accelerator, where our partners, there are 20 of the major hospital systems in New York City and across New York State. We also have partnered with sort of uh, a, a, a different player in running these programs who brings a different set of things to the table. 
In the case of the FinTech Lab, the partner is Accenture, who for a lot of uh, earlier stage companies can often be an implementation partner. Um, and then in the digital health, our partner is, the, is an affiliate of the New York State Department of Health, but it's a very interesting organization. It's the, it's the group that has been building out the platform that is going to connect all of the health records, electronic health records in New York State. So it's the technology platform as well as all the policies which will allow any hospital and any doctor to share records across the state. So they sort of came to the table with that very interesting asset as well as a lot of provider relationships. So uh, what happens is that the companies that come in the program, we, and we run them one time a year because we're dealing with senior people and the sponsor is typically this, the chief technology officer or the chief information officer. And then they bring in the innovation people and, and business line people as appropriate. But the, uh, the companies are each that, are, that get accepted into these programs are each paired with one of the uh, banks. So I'll stick with the FinTech Lab as the example for now. Uh, you, you get two or three of the banks who are officially your mentors. And it's sort of through the CTO's office. And over the defined period of time, which in the case of the FinTech Lab is three months, you sit down with that chief technology officer and their people and whoever the, who are the relevant business unit is at the organization, and you get feedback on your product. And so it's like half a sales call. Everybody understands that at the end of the day, you're looking to sell them your product, and they might want to buy your product because they are the, one, the banks pick who's in the program. We facilitate the engagement, but they actually pick who they want to talk to and who they want to work with. And the kind of feedback that you're getting is helping you identify where in the organization should you start. Because typically, a large bank is not going to place a $5 million order with a startup. They're going to do a pilot for $100,000. And many products that FinTech companies develop could be applicable in about five different areas of the bank. And your challenge as an entrepreneur is figuring out where is the best place to start. Where are you solving problem number one or two and not problem 15? Because if your technology is addressing an urgent problem, there's a greater likelihood that you're going to get attention, you're going to get a pilot, et cetera. Whereas if you're problem 15, you might get a meeting. They'll say it's very nice, very interesting, and you don't hear from them, and you don't know why. So the program is very explicitly around that bank and sort of that mentor team helping you figure out how to navigate the organization. They'll also help you with your value proposition, right? So you're going in and you're saying, I think, you know, you should buy my product because it's going to do X, Y, Z for me. And they'll sort of test that for you. And they'll say, you know what? That doesn't, that doesn't, no one's going to buy that. So they help you hone so when you actually go in to do your sales call, you're prepared in a much better way to understand who your audience is, what's their need, what's the pain point, how are you solving that pain point. What's happened, uh, now we've run, we're going into our third year. What's happened in each of the years, which is kind of interesting, is one of the companies has gotten a fast no. So the bank took a look at the product. In one case, they beta tested it. And they came back and they said, you know what? The way your product is configured, we're never going to use it this way. You need to have this functionality in order, for to, in order for it to be interesting for us. But for a young company, that kind of feedback is as valuable because you got it in three months and not 18. And you, know, and you know more specifically why they didn't buy it as opposed to they're just not returning your phone call. Uh, and the other thing that's happened to companies is you go in, you, 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 you have a product, and you're solving this problem. What's happened every year is they go in and they talk about the problem they're solving, and the person at the bank says, not my problem. But can your technology solve this problem over here that you didn't even know about? And so what it's done is it's caused, um, you caused the, it's allowed these companies to sort of, in some sense, open a whole different market and a whole different way of looking at their product and positioning their product with not just that institution, but potentially with others. Um, so uh, we, it's not a full-time program. Uh, there's a, we do something uh, sort of a, w with the group once a week. 
and we bring in entrepreneurs, we bring in uh, CEOs from big corporates for them to go meet with one-on-one -on -one to understand how the, you know, so last year they had met with Ken Chenault, of, uh, CEO of American Express, who talked about American Express's approach towards technology. Um, because we understand by, folk, by picking later stage companies, you all have to run your business. Um, but where the main focus is, is where it should be at that stage, which is engaging with customers or potential customers. Um, so now just to sort of break down, uh, and, I'll, and I'll conclude with sort of the, the mechanics of it, if you will. So the FinTech Lab is three months. Um, we have an option of a 25K note, but it's convertible into your next round of financing. It's pretty entrepreneurial friendly. Um, but it's your choice as to whether or not you want to take that note. We have space, but again, it's your choice if you want to take the free space for the three months. But we do take a small warrant coverage in all the companies that come into the lab, but it is significantly less than, than the other programs, again, because we're targeting later stage companies. And it's about what you would pay an independent advisor who would be on your board. And it's sort of warrants priced at market. So that's the deal for the FinTech lab. For the digital health, um, just because of the pace of healthcare, that's a nine-month program. Um, and we're offering a uh, sort of a different financial deal. The, the capital there is up to $300,000, and we tranche it. So there's sort of a first three to four months, um, and then we do a check-in. And assuming you haven't blown yourself up or turned out to be really kind of disasters, um, and the hospitals are still engaged with your product, then you get the second tranche of money. And there, the warrant coverage is more in kind of the two, two and a half percent range um, in terms of, again, common stock warrants at market uh, at the time you come into the, come into the lab. And the digital health, same kind of focus. You're in there. The, the mentor is the chief scientific officer. Um, the hospitals have got, like, CTOs, CIOs, CMIOs. They've got a lot of Cs and there's medical in there. But again, um, you're engaging sort of with the people that know what the technology needs are, and then the user groups are brought in as relevant to what you're doing. Um, and we're in the first year of the Digital Health Accelerator. Great. Thanks, Maria. Any specific questions for Maria about uh, FinTech Lab or Health Initiative? So if not, we'll just move quickly to Richard. Oh, we got one? All right. We got one. Got a live one. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, fee for fintech was uh, equivalent to a board. Sorry, can you? You mentioned uh, that you don't take uh, six percent. What what do you take? It's less than one percent. Okay, and um, in the uh, medical side and the health side, do you work with firms outside of New York? So for both programs, the companies don't need to be in New York, but they must come to New York for the duration of the program. And we believe that if we do our job right, that you're going to want to have all, you, you will have gotten a lot of great customer traction, and you're going to want to set up set an office up. But you have to be here for the program. Yep. So, so Shiny is the um, that's that infrastructure that I mentioned. So our partner in the Digital Health Accelerator is the group that's creating that, and uh, the name of that organization is the New York eHealth Collaborative. So actually, the class in this year's Digital Health Accelerator is was the first group of companies that got access to that Shiny. They're going to be opening that up to a broader group of companies later on. But this year's class kind of got special access and special help understanding how to connect to that API. All these accelerators certainly have one issue in common, which is talent. So there are two parts to it. Number one is the entrepreneur. If you don't believe that his or her skills pass. But how do you attract really bright talent who essentially are going to be making one-fifth or one-eighth of what they're going to make for the labor market. I mean, what are you doing in common? What are you finding, what kinds of people are you finding who are interested in this other than some guy whose company sold to Google and he's now got $40 million, he's 28 years old, started at Disneyland? So we're... The people that have come to our, to, into our program have already decided to be entrepreneurs. So yeah. we're... Point. 
So how do we help them attract talent? Um, it's not an explicit part of our program, um, so it's not something that we offer. In, so we're, we're not putting out there that we're going to go fund you your CFO. We have, um, similar to the, uh, the accelerators, we have a group of mentors around the program. Uh, Chris Condy, who is the former CEO of SunGuard, is our executive in residence, and he's very sort of time intensive. And then we've got about 15 entrepreneurs, all of whom were C-level executives at fintech companies uh, that scaled to a successful exit. So all of those people know people. And they're there to mentor. And what starts to happen is, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm getting ready to hire a you know, CFO or I need a marketing person. And you sort of put the word out to that network, and they can come back with people. But we don't do an explicit um, connection with talent. Uh, yeah, we, we obviously interview the people who apply, but we don't we don't help them find talent. No. There's a gentleman in the back there. Once they're sold, no, we don't focus on that. Uh, the companies that are coming to us are probably pre that. I mean, they're, they're, they're still trying to get enough traction so they become interesting to be bought. Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, I don't, um, I, I mean, at, at this point, there haven't been a ton of exits um, because the companies are all still pretty young. But I think that, um, I mean, we certainly help them a lot in terms of negotiating the transactions and, and evaluating the transactions and thinking if this is a good, a good fit for them for what they're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, in terms of helping them once they're in the company. Uh, and again, we, we certainly would be there, um, you know, as questions come up on kind of an ad hoc basis. I don't know if we specifically provide, you know, any, any as part of the program, any kind of trainings for how to integrate into a large company. Um, I have a question of Maria. I, I hope I have, I have understood you correctly, but uh, you, seem to be, you seem to be saying that, that basically all the funding in your fund, it comes... It comes from it comes from the private sector. So, what exactly is a role played by the government? I mean, like what what exactly is a role played by the there city of New York? We're a private fund. Oh, okay, but it is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we partner with city and state, but we are a private fund. Okay. That's why we changed our name because we were getting confused. Okay, and, and just one last question, if I may: um, Are there other such funds uh, in other cities in the country that you're aware of? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, in the back there. Hi, how much do the, hi, how much, a question for Maria, how much do the institutions, the 14 banks and one insurance company, either contribute in capital into the fund or pay as an annual fee uh, to get access to the program? Uh, nothing. So uh, actually, a number of the banks that are participating invested in the fund 15 years ago. And so each institution put up a million dollars 15 years ago. That was a one-time shot. The banks, do, but for the FinTech Lab program, the banks do not put up any money. The little bit of money that we have around the table comes from ourselves and a group of, there's a syndicate of about five other venture funds that put that money up. So the banks are at the table providing time. They throw in a little breakfast, but um, now and then, but they're putting, it's really, it's sort of their willingness to be at the table to spend time with these companies is the key thing. Question is for John. Uh, when people apply for the ERA, do you take more than one application from a person with, like, if they have more than one idea? Um, <laughs> very good question. But by the way, the fact you asked shows how early some of our companies are. Um, no, we wouldn't. We did on one occasion have someone submit multiple applications, and we told them, you know, we understand things may change, but come up and pitch us, come up and pitch us a company, come up and pitch us one. So uh, we would encourage people to come and pitch us their best idea. There have been cases in interviews when companies are really early when we said, we like you, do you have anything else you're working on? Um, and that's, that's rare. That's usually when we like the team and we get a sense that the business they're talking to us about is really, really early. Um, that still only fits, you know, out of a class of 10, 
Maybe we'll take one or two, which I'll describe as team bets, which are folks who we love the team but really don't have much of anything yet in the way of product. So the answer is anyone's applying, and we're, we're, our applications are open for the summer now too. Um, I would suggest applying once and then come talk to us. Let's say if you rejected them once, and second time, do they apply with the same idea or oh, something different? Uh, uh, we've seen both. We've had people we've rejected apply again with the same company. Uh, when there's been progress made, we've taken another look at them. And um, if it's someone who's changed companies, that's fine as well. I mean, it's, um, you know, that, that's, that doesn't, either way, just depending on you know, what makes sense for that, that company, that person. Right. I mean, just to, to add to that, I think, um, you know, one thing, if, if you're thinking about these types of programs is, is not, you know, if you, if you, uh, you know, we haven't talked too much about, about the percentages, but if you look at the percentages of likelihood of getting in based on, you know, the number of applications, it probably sounds very daunting when, when you're taking 10 or 15 companies and getting 500 plus applications. But, um, you know, being, there's nothing, there's no stigma, I guess, against being, you know, rejected, so to speak, in a year. And in fact, um, if you can, uh, you know, it's still good to get on, get on our radar. Uh, and, you know, we've had uh, a number of companies where they have reapplied uh, in subsequent sessions or years, and, uh, and we have accepted them, and they've done, and they've actually done extremely well. Um, you know, one of the, I think, the challenges we have in, in just the whole application process is we are making decisions in a very compressed time frame. So to the extent you can help uh, extend that either by getting into the process early and, and getting to uh, getting us familiar with you early, or uh, even if you're not accepted, uh, keeping us posted, then we have a much longer track record to evaluate of how you, um, you know, how you think about your business and how you work and all that. So, um, you know, anyone who either has applied or, or might apply and may not get accepted, it, you know, don't, don't be discouraged by that. It can actually, um, actually help you in the next go around. I was curious to know why, uh, Jonathan, you discouraged the pivot. Why we discourage the pivot? Well, uh, that's, that's, that's why I, I guess the next level of detail. It's not that we discourage the pivot. It's that we don't like take we don't take teams who are planning to pivot. We we'd prefer people who come in and say, "Hey, we've got a business we're going to try." And then if it doesn't work out, then that's fine. We encourage them if they're going to fail, fail quickly, and then decide to pivot to something else. I also, when you say pivot, it can be used to mean two things. And just let me clarify. Pivoting is kind of changing the focus of their business or changing their, their revenue model or changing the product or even their, how their customer focus within the same call it area is something that we encourage all the time and happens all the time. The other way pivot is sometimes used is to mean companies who literally I mean, teleport is a better word, and just completely change what they're doing. And we have had one or two of those. That's what I meant we discourage. I mean, if, it's, if the company is failing and um, that's the best thing for it to do, then okay. But we'd prefer to take teams and companies that are, you know, we, we believe will be able to succeed in their, you know, initial area of focus. That make sense? Yeah, sorry. Um, do you take teams that don't have a tech co-founder on board already? We don't buy. We require a tech co-founder uh, on the team. We we don't. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule that we require a tech co-founder. I would say uh, it probably increases your chances significantly if you do. But uh, we have had situations where we we have taken companies where. Uh, there wasn't a tech co-founder, but they at least were able to demonstrate to us that they are capable of, of figuring out how to get stuff done. So, I mean, there have been some cases where we've taken companies where their first iteration, they may have outsourced uh, to somebody else. And at least they demonstrate to us that they have the wherewithal to marshal resources and, 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 and do all that. Um, so, while well, I said, well, all things equal, yes, it's definitely better. It's, in our case, it's not a, it's not a 100% a requirement. And if you don't have a CTO, by the time you get to us, you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> to the uh, accelerators on the panel, what's your business model for covering operating costs? And is enterprise value really tied to the carrier equity stakes that you're getting in, in the businesses? The enterprise value for, for us, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, our, our model is, uh, I mean, we, we have a fund ourselves um, that that we raise to um, you know to fund our, our program both the, the stipends and the uh, and the operations. In fact, we're in the middle of raising a, a much larger fund uh, to cover uh, kind of multiple years of the program. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, 
the um, you know the model is just that obviously we're taking this equity stake and, and we're we're obviously um, <laughs> anticipating that over time uh, with with the with the it's kind of we think a, a much better diversify if you want to invest in kind of the early stage world uh, it's a it's a very diversified way to do that because you're getting um, you know exposed to or getting getting positions in you know 100 200 companies um, in one in one swoop, so we think that that hopefully mitigates the risk of of you know them being you know very early stage companies. Yeah, I mean our interest is the same. We we have a, a fund as well that we invest out of. That's where we cover the operating costs as well. And again, the economic model is the appreciation of the investments we make in the companies. We so are a nonprofit, so we're not looking to make any money. We pay for the expenses out of our fund. Accenture does everything pro bono, and we get a lot of pro bono help. So we're doing this uh, because it's part of our mission to create jobs in New York. Right. It's from Mark and Jonathan. Um, just wonder whether you give us some insights into the um, startups that have submitted applications for your summer class. What kind of industries do they come from? And also, what industries or sectors are you still looking for that you haven't seen submissions from? Thanks. <laughs> Sure. So, um, you know, the ongoing applications, we're not, you know, I'm not really going to comment on too much of specifically what we're seeing. I mean, they're, um, they're, they're still, they're still coming in. Um, in terms of, you know, trends we see in general, if I looked at, I think we've seen, you know, I would call it versus a year ago, more B2B focused startups than some of the B2C, just relative, rel relative weight of the, of the number of applications we're seeing. Um, I think, you know, so we're always looking for, uh, you know, industries I mean, you know, d directly with us. We do look for balance. For example, we didn't have any ed tech companies the last couple of times. We'd love to find one. That's more just we look at our own portfolio and area. We've got other areas we're always looking for. Things like ad tech we're always looking for or pub tech in that area. One or two companies. It's an area we know well and we think fits New York. Um, other areas, it's more like this time we happen to have two fintech companies and two real estate tech companies. Um, we probably wouldn't see that number in every class. It's just kind of what we found that we liked. But um, that's that's my quick answer. Yeah, no, I think it's it's similar with us. I mean, I mean, for as far as this session goes, I think it's it's probably a little too early um, because we're still um, you know fairly early in the in the application process. But and startups procrastinate on their applications. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if there's any if there's any tip you want, you know, don't don't like fifty percent of, of the people out there wait to the last forty eight hours yeah. to submit your application. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. It seems like there's no way around that. Um, but but uh, you know, it's it's pretty uh, generally it's it's pretty broad. I mean, you do see a uh, really interesting. I think. To to see what some of the themes are this year. I mean, last year there were there were a large number of, of you know the Pinterest of this or Pinterest related that uh, that seems to be the thing last year. Um, so we'll see what what is the thing this year. It'll probably be the Snapchat of something. <laughs> and, just, and I think you know, I think both of us we, we try to avoid a lot of those. Like it was you know, it was two years ago Groupon for X right. and it was Pinterest for dogs. I mean, just I'm not I'm not I wish I was kidding. Um, and those are pretty easy to go through, but we see a lot of those copycats and clones. It works in some, it should be fun of it, in some foreign countries you've seen people do that to succeed, things like Groupon for X country and work, but I mean, as far as we're concerned for here, it's just not going to interest us. I mean, right. Yeah. But yeah, and then I mean, we do, we, there are certain, I mean, again, we, we also look for, uh, we're not really looking generally for specific sectors of, or types of companies. It's really more of the, you know, to use the sports, sports analogy, looking for the best available athletes, you know, so if we, uh, you know, if we find three great linebackers, and instead of a linebacker, a wide receiver, and a quarterback, we'll we'll take three linebackers. Um, and we don't want companies that are competing, but but we we really look for, I mean, more than anything else, great teams. Having said that, we do actually this summer have an education track, which we we've done in the past. So we will be looking specifically for ed tech companies, and we also have a program for minority led um, companies, which is a program we do with with Comcast. So there are some there are some specific tracks, but um, but otherwise, it's pretty broad. Are, are there any industries that you think are incompatible uh, with New York City, and are there any industries that you think are sleepers, where there's uh, a big opportunity, but not a lot of uh, not a lot of people there? Life sciences. Yeah, is a sleeper. <laughs> but what's uh, anything incompatible? I mean, you meant you know. So, you know, for, from our perspective, and. You know, I, I think it's not incompatible, more difficult companies which require um, a thousand engineers off the bat to get started, and by exaggerating by a thousand, I think are still difficult to, to start in New York. I think that um, not impossible, but place this, things that come you know, out of industry or play to where industry is, let's say, either you're disrupting or they're your customer, 
and a few and a few technologists can get started doing it, and then it can grow. I think lend to the city's strength. I think companies. I'll use Palantir as an example, where you were basically talking about a hundred engineers right off the bat with what they were doing in the valley. I think those companies, until you see a lot more engineers in New York, are going to be harder to start here. I mean, that would be my again, not not impossible, but I, I think there'll be a while before you see them. I don't know what's your. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, I think certain things. I mean. Maria mentioned life sciences. I mean, life sciences, I think, is, is a tough one for, for our model, again, because also because you know, we want to find companies that we feel like in, in, in the three months can make you know, meaning, really meaningful progress. And so when you get into the real hardcore science kind of stuff, it's, I think, becomes more, more challenging. I don't, I don't want to stop the torrent of questions, but there's one last panelist here who I wanted to make sure we've got one last aspect of you know, the thrilling uh, parts of the uh, intellectual property parts of, uh, of this uh, early stage ecosystem that uh, Richard wanted to address uh, briefly tonight. So. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer and I'm thinking, listening to all this and say, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> so uh, I, I once you asked- the drinks, Richard. Right, but, right. <laughs> so uh, uh, I once asked a, a more senior lawyer, what, are, you know, what good are we? What good are we as lawyers? He says, well, we keep an orderly society. So I heard that, I felt pretty good about myself. So uh, an example I was trying to think of is uh, to give an example of you why, uh, why lawyers are important or why we're, we're relevant. Uh, have have, have you, uh, any of you seen The Social Network, the Facebook movie? A few of you seen? Some of you? Well, The Social Network sort of had uh, half of it was about legal proceedings. It was uh, a, lot of, a lot of lawyers involved and, uh, with what happened. Is they, they, they started the company. They didn't really, uh, with Mark Zuckerberg and his partners there, they didn't really have anything in writing. Uh, there were some other intellectual property claims of, of people who'd, who'd, who gave Mark Zuckerberg some ideas. He sent some emails. Uh, these were the Winklevosses. They, had, they ended up with about $200 million because there were a few emails that went back and forth. Uh, they... Uh, uh, there were fights among the founders. They, uh, uh, they had to get financing. Uh, there was a, a location issue. This location is very important. And, and the, with Facebook, they went from Boston to Silicon Valley. Uh, there, now there are people coming from Silicon Valley back east because of uh, what New York's like. But um, so the, the message that I have as, as a lawyer and for entrepreneurs, and by the way, I've been an entrepreneur. Uh, I've, in, uh, I've invested. I've been a serial investor. I've taken uh, companies public. I've sat on public boards of companies, uh, NASDAQ that I took public. Uh, I think I hold the world record for an exit strategy. I, I invested in a company in 1993, and it went public last year, 19 years later. But God bless it. It was still in business, and it's profitable, and uh, they raised a lot of money. Uh, so uh, I sort of uh, understand what's going on, but what happens in the heat of battle uh, and uh, when you're working really trying just to, to keep your head above water, trying to get those customers, which is a lot of times the, the most difficult uh, piece and what the uh, accelerators uh, help you, you do, uh, you don't think of these, uh, the, these issues about having some kind of an understanding with your partners, uh, have some kind of an understanding with the accelerators, because you're going to get into a written agreement with the accelerators, uh, and also th thinking about that intellectual property and where, that might, about what might, uh, where you might have a claim in the future. Uh, and of course, if you fail, no problem, no, no harm, no foul. But if you're successful, uh, somewhere along the line, there are going to be people coming after you. So. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you really ought to put some thought into uh, at the beginning. It, uh, there are ways to deal, deal with lawyers uh, on the come a little bit. Uh, I have a big firm. We're, we're a thousand lawyers around the world, but uh, uh, we, we, do, uh, we do work with uh, uh, startups. And um, uh, lawyers also, if it's uh, somebody that you have confidence in, uh, they can be sort of a, a mentor may not be the right word, but uh, my clients, my, my early stage clients, they, they come to me and they sort of bounce ideas off, off of me and I'm sort of an in, independent. I'm not one of their partners. I'm not one of their customers. And uh, they look for so, sort of independent advice. And sometimes I give them the bad news. And, uh, but they'll accept the bad news and they'll tell them, look, you, this is what you have to do. You don't want to do it, but this is what you have to do. This is have to, how you have to deal with your employee. This is how you have to deal with your, uh, your investors. Uh, so uh, we, we can bring uh, some value to the table. Uh, and with that, I will conclude my remarks. Well done. Questions? 
Well, the, uh, the first of all is very important. I mean, if you do really have a patentable idea, and uh, most companies have some patentable idea, uh, you, you really should file as quickly as possible. There's things called provisional patents, where you really they can be done fairly, really relatively inexpensively. You just you really sit sit at your uh, word processor and you write up uh, 20 pages of what you what you do and why why it's novel and non non obvious non obvious and useful. Uh, that's what you need for a patent. So uh, you can you can file for patent protection fairly quickly, fairly inexpensively, and if you really do have a good idea, you ought to be able to do that. And I'm sure that. Uh, the accelerators are going to be advising you to do that. If you file a provisional, that gives you a year before you actually have to, have to convert it to an actual patent filing. So within that year, maybe you uh, you develop it a little bit more, you get some more financing, so it's easy to go forward. But I, I would advise doing the provisional as quickly as possible, really almost immediately. Uh, gentleman in the back there hasn't. I just wanted to shift gears if I could for a question and one of the questions that I've had about thinking about whether as an entrepreneur an accelerator particularly in New York City works is it sounds like mostly what you get are real estate office services those things what's your advice if nothing else on how do you handle things like paying your for your apartment paying for your groceries how does like that founder deal with that multi-month period, what kind of provisions or advice do you give them if they're participating in a program like yours? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> I get that one. Um, but, uh, Ram and so noodles. I guess a couple things. One, in terms of the, so we, we don't pretend to solve all the entrepreneur's problems. So um, the, the $40,000 we give the entrepreneur certainly provides some runway to a team and it's designed to do that. So it's designed to be able to, for the small team to, actually many of our companies actually don't use it for living costs. They use it to be able to hire an extra designer or do some work for some teams. They do use it, particularly some of the young teams to kind of augment their, their living costs. Um, I would say for anyone really starting a company in New York, and this isn't an official party line, this is me, you know, you would ideally have some runway. If, if you're if you're going to have a four month of runway, I would say you've got a problem. I mean, I would I, you've got to find a way to extend your runway beyond that. No accelerator is going to cure that. In a lot of ways, demo day at the end is the kickoff to the fundraising process, not the finishing. So we can remove expenses like you know real estate for you remove expenses like legal and hosting, but you know at the end of the day, and we give forty grand, but you know at the end of the day, that's not going to solve all your problems. I don't I mean. Right. I'd say we, you know, we would encourage them to go to all of our, our speakers and sessions where there's usually free free food. <laughs> this, uh, it's actually been amazing. We've figured out how they can live on X dollars a day, which, but yeah. So. Yeah. No, but people are, are really scrappy, and we do, we do try to try to help them and, and provide uh, best practices or 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 cheap eats or whatever it might be. Um, we all, we also do have some partnerships. We 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 have a relationship with NYU um, to provide um, you know kind of below market. Uh, you know, dorm, since we're in the summer, the dorms are available, so we have a relationship there where they can they can leverage that and get get you know, um, you know by New York standards, very reasonable um, living accommodations. So, in addition to free uh, legal help, free um, other things. It seems to me mentorship is a really important way for you to add value. So what are the incentives for mentors to get involved with accelerators in general? And what makes them pick one accelerator vis-a-vis -vis the other to get involved? What's the payback for them? Well, I, well, first of all, they, I, they're not typically picking one or the other. I mean, we've, there probably is a fair amount of overlap between, between the mentors in our, in our programs. So, uh, you know, we're certainly not asking mentors to be exclusive to our program. Um, you know, as far as what, what motivates them, I think, you know, a lot of these people just really, well, there can be a few things. I mean, a lot of them just, just want to, um, you know, have, a, have, be, have their, uh, there's just, a, I guess, a, you know, psychic reward, I suppose, of, of just working with entrepreneurs and helping them. If, if maybe they were previously entrepreneurs and, and you know, knew how valuable it was to have great mentorship. Uh, maybe somebody who's, who, I mean, in the case of, of, of investors, obviously there, there is uh, some motivation that they want to uh, hopefully use this as deal flow for them. Um, but, I, you know, I think a lot of it is really just, it, there is a big altruistic element to it where they're just doing it because it's something they want to give back to the community and, and participate in, the, in kind of the early stage 
uh, early stage world. We, we do give our mentors a, a small, well, our mentors, we, we, we have kind of do different classes of mentors, but our, our dedicated mentors where each company has kind of a, if you want to call it an Uber mentor who is spending um, three to five hours a week with the company during the program, they do get a small, um, a small stake in our, in our fund. But, but the reality is it's, 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 it's really, it's really more just of a, of a thank you. It's not going to be, you know, uh, probably anything hugely material, and that's certainly not the reason why, why the companies do it or why people do it. Almost identical. The only thing I'll add is, you know, for the entrepreneurs and engineers, there's such a strong culture of giving back to the community there. So, I mean, there is that already in, in both those communities. And then among among uh, investors, it's deal flow. And then we found actually a lot of the corporates, people want to be cool. They want to find out what's going on. They want to stay close to innovation. And so a lot of them, you know, get something back out of it for themselves, for their, for their own jobs. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's always surprising, you know, just getting in there and talking and not listening, you know, not reading the body language, not, re not listening to what they're saying to you, and going in with your agenda and your path as opposed to I'm going to, like, put something out there, but I'm going to see how it goes, and I'm going to be able to adjust. But the not listening part is really, like, the always surprises me. In the, in the early stage, I would say not doing enough, you know, we're earlier, like not doing enough customer discovery, guessing what you think customers are going to want and then trying to give it to them and being shocked when, when they don't want that. And, you know, that would be one of the other things also in the sales process is getting in front of the customers, you know, or before you've spent a year building the, the darn technology. And, again, that sounds simple, but um, it's a mistake a lot of folks make. Right. And I'd say another one that they make with, with and this is more with mentors and with companies, but I think that there's sometimes a feeling of um, almost almost not being as as um, transparent as you'd like them to be <clears throat> in that, in the wanting to paint a rosier picture than it really is. So when they're not getting, you know, the feedback that they want to hear, whatever, just, you know, there may be nine bad things they heard and one one good thing, and they'll, they'll tell you about the great thing they heard and, and not share you know, the full story. And you know, the only way a really a mentor can be helpful is, is, is to really know exactly everything that's going on. So uh, I think that's sometimes, uh, sometimes some of the entrepreneurs fail to do that. We had a quick story. We had one company who was reporting back. They had these great metrics. And they said, we're telling our companies this. And I said, well, what is it? From there, and they told me the metric. And I said, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. He's like, but this is a great metric. We're highway compared to what? And he did basically invented some metric <laughs> that they did well. And he was telling his customers. And they weren't understanding it. But he was really proud of it. We were like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. So you tell, you know, at some point, you can't just invent what you want to say. You've got to understand what the customers want and talk in a language they understand. But this is this is great. This is the first panel I've ever had where I never had to ask a question. Oh. So the enthusiasm <laughs> of the crowd is awesome. I, I need to have more of these, right? Um, but let's prioritize by the microphone. If you have a microphone and if you haven't asked a question already, you're, we should definitely want to prioritize you as well. So please, go ahead. Hi, this is um, for the um, accelerators. Do they ever accept individual entrepreneurs who are not tech but have a programmer and also are the programs only full time meaning they have to be dedicated you know, like you, you're bootstrapping and you're working and and you're working on your your um, business on the side so that's that's my question well the first part of it you were saying an, an individual who right The, the program that's not right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mentioned before. I think that. Uh, yeah. I mean, we. It's always uh, preferable in our case to have a have a tech person who's who's a kind of co-founder and, and they're full time. Uh, in our case, it's not a, it's not a hard and fast requirement. And again, if you can demonstrate that you uh, are able to marshal the resources to 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 do stuff, then. Um, uh, it's not a requirement. I mean, it, but I mean, there, there's kind of two issues here. There's one having a tech person. There's also a single person. You know, and, and, and again, our, 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 I wouldn't say never, but it's it's very rare that we'll take a single person. Um, you know, company. Uh, as far as the full time thing, in, in our case, it, it is. Uh, I mean, certainly for the, for the core of the founding team, uh, it's a requirement that they that they're there full time because again, part of the a big part of the the value of the program is is, is a set that community element, and we really want people who are going to be really in this you know full throttle and are there uh, as well because I think everybody benefits from everybody being there. Yeah, and just so we probably take a slightly harder line on the on the tech founder, we've we kind of morph from more where Mark is to basically being no, we just want a, a tech founder on the team. Um, we do need the team to be full-time. Uh, single founders, we've had one. We're not a fan of them. 
for reasons I, I'll spare you. Um, but in terms of the the part time, there are other programs. We are we are full time. Our companies. There are other programs. There's I mean there's Founders Institute. There's a bunch of different ones out there which are um, part time or nights and evenings. And if full time is an impossibility, um, certainly worth exploring some of those. I mean I think the more immersive ones you get more out of because you're there full time. But if that's not an option, I do think there's some to look into. Um. The, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the question I have, which hasn't really been discussed, which is invaluable, is what about pricing? I mean, in the beginning, if it's a new product to a new industry, somebody's just guessing that this is worth X, Y, or Z. How have you helped the entrepreneurs price their products? And I, both in terms of making them too expensive, but also not giving them away. I mean, I, you, you just to make sure I understood. How do how do we encourage entrepreneurs to figure out pricing models for their products? Is that the the question? So certainly, working with them in business model is one of the things we do. I mean, there's no firm rule. I, I think at the moment you're finding a lot of variations of business models. Some it's freemium, which is you know giving away some element to the product and then charging for some other features. Some it's selling from the get-go. I mean, there's it, it depends on the industry and the case. And in some cases, it's a matter of it's clear. In other cases, it's a matter of testing different revenue models and sees what works. So do we work with them on it? Yes. Um, is there a magic answer? No. Uh, question about uh some of these companies are not really companies yet when they apply to your program. So uh, legal formation of a company, is that the first order of business, or what, what do you recommend for that? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, in some cases, uh, that is correct. In some cases, the companies you know, aren't even technically companies yet. And yeah, that's part of the, the services that the, the, the law firms that we're partnered with will, will provide. Um, I'd, I'd say most of the companies have at least done, you know, some basic, you know, have incorporated or set something up. And some of the companies are are further along where they will actually have customers or live websites or what have you. And obviously, they've certainly uh, established themselves. But if they are really early, we we do help them with those with that process. We also make all our companies out of uh, convert to Delaware C's. We only we don't do LLC investment. Just, we, we only do yeah. We'll make you. That's the other thing. So if you're LLC, we'll make you convert to a Delaware C. We don't, I mean, we don't, we don't require it, but I'd say most of them are. Yeah, our theory is the investors after us are all going to require it, so let's get it cleaned up now. That's why. Yeah, right. so, yeah. well, assuming it's VCs. the angels play? I, I'm <laughs> sure that uh, you guys, the accelerators, know the answer to this question, or I, I would hope you do. Um, but I've always wondered, what is the uh, success rate of companies that go through accelerators versus those who don't? given that you want to hold yourself to the same standards of the companies that apply to work for you. Do, is there enough data now or have accelerators been around long enough so you can say that what you do, which is an incredibly exciting job, uh, and I'm sure we're all here because it's, you know, it's a sexy topic, but that it works. And it works significantly enough to be worth all the effort that you guys are all putting into it. Well, I, I guess there are a couple couple threads to that. One uh, one of my partners has a great saying about as far as the, the, the success of the companies. Um, you know, he'll say our success rate is one hundred percent in that, uh, and not because all the companies. I mean, you know, I, I, you may see on the slide. I mean, I, I think three quarters of our companies are are still in business. Some of our companies will will kind of disband pretty soon after they leave the program, but that that's okay. It's, it's similar to what to what Maria said before about the fast no. I mean, in some cases, a company may come in, come in with the best of intentions, and we, we thought it was a great idea. And upon further review and digging into it, we realized there's some flaws in there. And again, we'd rather have the company just kind of, uh, or the people, <laughs> figure out the, the next thing to do with their lives than, than you know, raise $500,000 and just waste it in, um, kind of without having figured out what they're going to do. So, um, you know, failing fast is, 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 part, of, is part of the model, and that's, and that's, that's great. So uh, hopefully we provide a, a good experience for all the companies, and I think based on the surveys, we, I think we do. You know, as far as measuring success of the, of the accelerators themselves, I mean, it's probably, um, you know, I mean, we, we've done back testing on our, on our model to date, um, and, you know, I think we feel pretty good about the numbers, but obviously a lot of that is still on paper because all these things are pretty new. But... Um, I guess you can ask that question again in, in, in five years, and we'll give you another answer. Yeah, I mean, just you can look at some, I mean, a lot of these are pretty new. You can look at some metrics like 
what percent of companies are getting funded. And that, that's hard. You can't really do that against the, what, the rest of the companies in the world, but just relative to what's a good or a bad accelerator. Or uh, you can also look at things like average valuation and the companies are coming out of them with. And, you know, and, and I think it's too early to know what's going to be long-term success. I think the, the folks you see up here and some of the known ones have pretty good early numbers in terms of who have, what percent are getting funded and what, what those valuations are compared to the market. But, you know, Time will tell to when you figure out how many public companies come out of our collective classes in the next five years. I mean, um, this gentleman here, do you want to talk? There you go. I'm curious if anyone on the panel has seen any kind of movement away from Web 2.0 idea of viability that counts on you know all the crowdsourced content and things of interest being added to it versus the more old-fashioned idea of the founding team company putting in their own proprietary content, high barrier to entry technology, you know, or service. Um, so I, I guess even the, the definition of Web 2.0 and what was in it and what isn't, I, I kind of think is a, a bit of a fluid one. But in terms of the, you know, crowdsource versus proprietary, I don't know. We, we see both, and we always have. I think a lot of the buzz around Web 2.0 with some of the companies that were all the, the social or mobile social or mobile social local that got a lot of the buzz. But in terms of the companies there that are succeeding, you know, I think you've seen you know both. I mean, we had a company called Stray Boots, which was an urban guide, for example, and still is that's doing well, where they actually people they developed their own content, it's like a Lonely Planet 2.0, and they developed their own and sold it. Scavenger, I mean, before they pivoted, was doing crowdsource more. Both were getting a lot of users. Both had different models, and they were both. You know, operating in different ways. Mm. So in general, are we seeing, you know, I think we're seeing less people pitching and just say, hey, we're going to put this app out and get a billion users in it without doing anything, if that's what you mean, which, which, which we did see more of. Um, but in terms of the overall trends, I mean, I don't know. I think you see both. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would say there. I've seen a, a trend particularly one way or the other. Um, but I think, you know, in general, with, with uh, uh, in, in both cases, I think, I think, what, what what companies I think well, what we constantly tell companies is that that the I, I mean we, you know we have also like like um, like Jonathan mentioned it's probably half B two B half B two C but B B two C companies whether they're crowdsourced content or or proprietary content you know building an audience is is a lot um, is a lot easier said than done <laughs> it looks really easy when you see when you see you know Pinterest or, or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever but for every one of those there are you know ten million that. Uh, you know, our number, you know, 250,000 in the App Store. Yeah, and the other thing you have to tell them is even the, the overnight successes are rarely overnight in that. Like Pinterest is pointed to as an overnight success. It wasn't overnight. They spent, you know, it was quick, but they spent, you know, a year and a half or year, two years before they even actually fit out how to get users that actually then it took off. So it's always funny when people talk about the overnight successes. Even those crazy ones usually aren't overnight. <coughs> One last question, and then um, we're going to have a uh, reception. So if you have a question, um, all these guys are probably Googleable online and findable. Um, you can easily email them a question, um, and I'm sure they'll respond. Or, or better yet, tweet, and uh, I'm sure they'll get an even better response. So uh, uh, one, la one last question. Okay, I have uh, uh, actually two. Um, <laughs> Very popular. Steve, we'll be. Steve was prepared for that. Um, I want to ask Maria. Uh, what, if any, advisory services are provided to the company, say, in the fintech uh, lab? And uh, going for customers is very different from developing the whole strategic model for the company. It depends. So um, it depends on sort of what the company needs. But again, the core engagement is really the customer engaging with the customers. So it's really around the product. There's not a lot of time spent on um, explicitly around building out your marketing team, et cetera. We do have this group of entrepreneurs around, and so the companies in the lab have access to those people and go in and have office hours and talk about a broad range of things. So a lot of those topics come up. You know, how do you build a consulting firm? How should I pay my people? How should I do my pricing, et cetera? But that's a very kind of company-specific thing. Peer here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it also seems to me that the accelerators are totally focused on the 1% of companies that may get equity funding. That uh, you really are looking for companies that are going to have to be venture-backed. 
not just on companies that are going to build kind of sustainable models. That, uh, <coughs> well, ours are all venture. All, are all of ours would be venture backed as well. <laughs> so all of these are going to be venture backed. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily true in our case. I mean, we, I'd say all the companies were, were expecting that there'll be some kind of uh, exit event at some point. Um, but we've had, we've had numerous companies and, and uh, that, that have, you know, that have, that are still, you know, have been in the, they were in the program a few years ago and have kind of bootstrapped and continue to just grow organically. Um, we love that. I mean, you know, we, if, if you can, if you can make that work and, and us not have to get, us and the, the founders don't have to get diluted, um, we have no issue with that. In fact, the company I mentioned, you know, we had a very good exit with this company, Note Hall. Um, you know, had I mean, they had raised angel money, they hadn't raised venture money. <clears throat> it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a Facebook style exit, but, but, um, uh, you know, but at, at the same point, we hadn't been really diluted much at all, so it, it worked out quite well. Yeah, I mean, same answer as Mark. I mean, it's, a, it's venture or angel. Theoretically, we could have companies that don't need to raise any money. I'm skeptical most of ours will probably at some point need at least some angel money to get I mean if we had a company that all of a sudden hit on a cash spigot we got one that's possible and never need to raise I'd be thrilled we don't get diluted that's that's great usually they'll need at least you know so most of the ones we see will need some money to grow ahead of cash flow but you know great I'm gonna take the last word if I could so if anybody out there is at a fintech company or knows of one and you're in the middle of a seed round or have raised one I'm interested in talking to you it's just any other last words? Uh, no, just if you're interested in, in accelerating, just apply to Dream It or ERA. <laughs> yeah, my, my one of the last comment, if you are applying, is talk to the graduates of the programs, whether it's you know ours, Marks, or any other one you're thinking about. That's what I would do to figure out if what the experience is really like, and you know, all, all we all have the companies on our sites and. You know, that, that's how to tell. I think there's a lot of good accelerators. I think there's some that honestly don't deliver a lot of value. Um, no one who was here tonight. And so that's why I would always check with founders to make sure, um, graduate founders, to see what their experience was like. Great. Well, thank you, guys. And thanks, Holland, tonight. They're great. Great night. And please feel free to stick around for reception. And yeah. these guys will be around for a little bit, too. Presentation. Answer some more of your questions. <laughs> Things that are casually advising on.